Right. Good evening. Good to see everybody. Um, I think that my internal clock is right now two in the morning. So forgive me for not perhaps being completely on my game, but it's very good to see everybody and thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank Jesse uh, for, thank you. I want to thank Jesse for uh, inviting me to give the shiur. Um, I, I want to just say that I, I heard, you know, the initial thoughts about even beginning this program. And, um, and I just thought, what an amazing thing to be able to do this program for everybody, to give people an opportunity to be able to study Tanakh. You know, I mean, we study a lot of things. We study Gemarot and Halachot and, and uh, all the areas of Torah, Baruch Hashem, and Brooklyn is a fantastically strong place that this can happen in. But a lot of times, you know, we neglect the, we neglect Tanakh and, you know, being a former Rosh Hashiva Barkai, you probably know, if you know anything about Barkai, you know that we care very much about the, the Mikra. And the reason we do is because it's, you know, it's the source of everything. If we don't have Mikra, we don't have really anything. It's very difficult to know Torah without it. And there's a, there is a, um, a, she, a, a book of She'elot Uchuvot called Torah Lishma. And this book of She'elot Uchuvot is attributed most often to the Benish Hai. Zecher Tzadik Levracha. Hacham Avadya Zatzal disagrees with this. He doesn't think that it's from the Benish Hai. And the main reason he doesn't think so is because there's a huge amount of contradictions between this particular She'elot Uchuvot and all the other writings of the Benish Hai. Regardless of what it is, it's clear that She'elot Uchuvot Torah Lishma is written by a great Talmid Hacham. And this was a question, this is just intro. We're, we'll get into the intro to the intro of, uh, of Sefer Melachim's intro to intro. And uh, the question that's posed to the Hacham and Sefer, this Shelo Chuvot, is the following scenario. They say that, you know, they were sitting on uh, Chabav uh, during the reading of Echa, and the book, they had Minhag also to read the book of Eyov. Many people have the Minhag to read the book of Eyov on Chabe'av. And everybody's sitting on the floor and they're taking turns reading the Pesukim of Echa and Eyov. Eyov, it's not the easiest book in the world. The words are not easy. The Pesukim are not easy. But either is Echa. It's not the easiest book. So they're taking turns and there's this one guy who just can't get the words right. Forget about the explanations. He's just not reading the words right. But he was calling himself a rab. He kept calling, they said that this man is a rabbi, he's a rab. So they wrote to the hacham of Torah Lishma, who in the book is, calls himself Yehezkel Kahli. And he says to this, he responds to the person that they called, that while the reading was going on, one of the men who was reading appropriately called this man, who called himself a rabbi and couldn't pronounce the words, a boor, which in English is a boor. Right? Meaning he's just a, a, an ignoramus, worse than an ignoramus. So they ask, so, you know, they ask the dean, uh, do they have to apologize for calling this man a boor that's not able? And the rab of the Shelo Chuvot writes back, he says, no, you don't have to apologize because he is a boor. If he can't read basic pisukim of Tanakh, He's a boor, and so the fact that you called him what he is may not have been the, in the greatest of taste, but nonetheless is accurate. And so what that tells us is how important it is to be able to be familiar with Tanakh, if nothing else than what it is. What we call it is mikra, to be able to read it. To be able to read it and to know its words and that the words should, should be part of our lives. It should be the way that we think. And the truth of the matter is, is that in the old days, and probably better days, we would never let this fly nowadays because we become very academic, but in the old days, the only way that they taught Tanakh was to just feed children the words. Read the words, just read the words and repeat the words, and read the words and repeat the words, and read and repeat and read and repeat. And this was how we learned Tanakh, to the point that the words of the Tanakh became the very language of our thoughts. They were always in our thoughts, in our minds, the words of the Nevi'im and of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Torah. These were our words that we thought of to the point that we used to use them even playfully 
we would make plays on words and change pesukim in our in our dialogue. Chacham of Zatzal was an expert at this. He did this all the time. And the reason for that is very simple: is that the words of the Nevi'im are kodesh. They're holy. And there's nothing that you can fill a child with that is better than the words of the Torah and the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim. They don't need anything else. You want to give them pirushim? You can give them pirushim. Usually you destroy children by giving them pirushim. You can let them discover pirushim as they get older, but they just need words. And from that, everything else is built. But we don't trust the words. We don't feel that that's enough. We have to give them all these pirushim and so on and so forth. And what they end up having is some obscure pirushim, but words still they don't have, and then they get called a bur when they're reading Echa in, uh, you know, in Kinesi. But this project is a beautiful one because it does, it gives us an opportunity to be able to connect on a basic level to the, the mikra, to the very source of all of our Torah. And I want to commend Jesse and everybody that's working with him in doing it because I get the emails and I see how easy it is. It's almost embarrassingly easy. It's so easy that it's very difficult to have an excuse not to do it. Because not only do you get the email on a daily basis of the perik, but you actually have the perik in the email, which means you scroll down a touch and there the words are of the entire perik. And guess what? Not only are the words there in Hebrew, they're there translated in English, which is a language that most of us speak, although I'm finding now that there's a different kind of English that people speak. I was always thinking that we did, but I, apparently we don't speak English. So it's all right there for you. You want to go a little bit further, you have click, one click, you have a perush, you have a class on it by a very competent scholar, a rav. So it's all right there. All, all we're going to try and do tonight is none of that important stuff. We're doing the less, the less important stuff. Um, we're going to talk about a sefer, because we're just beginning sefer merachim. And um, I, there is an importance in terms of being able to not just learn the words, but to have a sense of framework about a particular sefer. What is, the, what is sefer talking about? When we take one or two steps back away from it, what does it look like in its entirety to us? And so I just wanted to share some thoughts with you about it, some of many possible thoughts about what the Sefer might be and how we might relate to it. And the reality is that Sefer Melachim is a, is a deceiving name for the book. I'll just wait till everybody... Sefer Melachim is a deceiving name for the book because you would think by, by reading Sefer Melachim that you're reading of kings. That you're reading of Malchut, of a monarchy. And unfortunately, it's very little, very little in the book. That you barely are reading about that in the book. What you're reading about in the book for 90% as a rough estimate of the book is the det deterioration of the monarchy. What you're reading about is the failure of Malchut. You're reading about the decline of Malchut. It is the book written according to our Mesorah by the same Navi who writes Sefer Echa, who writes the book of the end of Malchut, of the destruction of Malchut, of the, the result of a failed Malchut, of which we are still experiencing the results today in this 2,000-year Galut. So it's a, it's a name that is a bit, a bit misrepresented, misrepresenting what it is that you think you're reading in the book, except that what I'd like to, to express tonight, to take a look at tonight, is that, of course, it isn't. We, we named it appropriately. But it may just not be what it is we expect. It's not a book in where we are reading about the grandeur and greatness of Malchut. As a matter of fact, where you read the, about that is in the book of Shmuel, who was the architect of the Malchut. The Malchut was his 
doing the works of his hand. The Navi Shmuel, he built everything, he developed everything, he crowned two kings. He crowned two kings. And this is why we read about the fact when the first king that he crowns is removed from the post, that he cannot get over it. Shmuel can't get over the fact that Shaul HaMelech is no longer Melech. He cries about it all night long. Akadosh Baruch Hu has to personally console him. He cannot manage to deal with the fact that this Melech that he crowned, the first Melech of Israel, even though it was a Melech that had been crowned under contention by God himself and Shmuel, for that matter. Shmuel is very upset about the fact that they asked for a king. What we read of in the book of Shmuel is the ascension towards Malchut. The development towards Malchut. And we read about the greatest king of Israel and his monarchy. In Shmuel, not in Sefer Melachim. What we open, the book of Melachim opens with the end of David's reign. The point essentially where David is no longer acting as king, and what we find that happens at the beginning of the book is that King David, David Amelech, needs to be pulled back into active duty as a king. Because for all intents and purposes, he has removed himself. The book opens telling us the Amelech David Zaken, that King David was old. Baba Yamim, that he had come of days, he couldn't get warm. Very strange story about the fact that he can't get warm. And there's this entire drama that unfolds at the very beginning of the book and where there's this plan between his then wife Batsheva, the mother of Shmuel, Sh Shlomo Melech, not yet Melech, 12-year-old child, and the Navi Natan. And where they sit together and decide how it is that they're going to address David because his son has usurped the throne. Without David paying attention, he's not really engaged in the day-to-day -day things that are going on. He's removed himself from these things. So Natan runs in, Bacheva runs in, Natan runs in. They tell him this is a horrible situation. You have to deal with something. If you don't do something now, Bacheva says, We're going to be off on the outs all of our days. You promised me that Shlomo would be king and get up and do something. This is what happens. This is the opening of the book. So we open the book with the malchut in the lack of stability. Terrible trouble. And that sets the tone for the rest of the book. This whole Melachim Aleph and Bet thing is a later development. We're talking about the entire book and where the book ends, essentially, with Israel falling apart. And layer by layer, and we'll examine this, We'll examine this layer by layer. And you will see this if you learn it perik by perik, as you're doing in this project, very clearly, this rapid devolution of the Malchut Israel. So it's a very poignant book. It's a very difficult book to read. It's not a happy book. It is a sad book. It's a book that, it, that, that in where you watch the dismantling of our people. And it happens in very clear stages. We go back and forth between Malchut Yisrael, Malchut David, Malchut Yehuda, back and forth. And you see that Malchut Yisrael positions itself in a very precarious position. Again, we'll talk about this in a more, bit more detail. Under Yerovam ben Evat, he's constantly referenced back throughout the entire book that everybody kept following Yerovam ben Evat and his ways and what he did, destroyed Israel till the entire kingdom of Israel is thrown out. Then we focus on Yehuda, they deteriorate down to oblivion, they're thrown out, the entire thing crashes and burns and dissolves, and that's the end of the book. It's not, it's not an uplifting book like the book of Shmuel. Shmuel is a very exciting, uplifting book. It's a book that talks about the greatest achievements of Israel, but you know that because you've done it. So we'll talk about the, you know, where we go from here. So essentially what we're looking at is the waxing and waning of the moon. That's why coming on Rosh Chodesh this week, 
And in a couple weeks after that, we'll say the Birkata de Bana, as we always do, if it's nice and not too cloudy out. And we say that Israel is essentially like the moon. Shigam him atidin lithadesh kemota, right? That Israel is going to end up becoming new like the moon. And that's what we do. We look at the moon and we see that the moon waxes and wanes. That it gets larger and larger and larger until it's completely full and beautiful and bright. And immediately, it doesn't stay there. And immediately, it starts to become less and less and less and less. So it shaves away. And that's what happens to the moon. In the same way that we read the book, this is a very clear analogy. The Hachamim saw this very clearly. It's very clear visually to be able to see this, that layer after layer, the moon is shaved away. Shaved away. Shaved away becomes a sliver. Till there's nothing there almost just covered up. And, and so that's what we're looking at. So what we're looking at in this book is the slivering, the shaving away of the moon. But we start with the full moon. We start with the full moon. We start with the Malchut of Shlomo. And so the book opens. Shlomo becomes king shortly after the opening of the book. It ends up working out. And he promptly gets to building the Beit HaMikdash. And the Mikdash becomes the focus through this entire book. The connection between the Mikdash and the Malchut. And you don't have Melech without Mikdash. To the point that Yerovam ben Evad, when he ends up having to secede from the rest of the Malchut, he has to essentially establish his own Mikdash because he won't go up to the regular Mikdash because he has to face the king in the regular Mikdash. And he can't sit and that Mikdash, like the king of David or the Yehuda can sit, he's not going to go to a Mikdash where the king of Yehuda can sit and he has to stand. We're not going to do that. I need a Mikdash, so I'll make my own Mikdash. And that's how it ends up developing. But there's no question about the fact that the Mikdash is central to the king and the king to the Mikdash. They are essentially connected and they run in the same situation in terms of the development of history to the point that when the king falls apart, the Malchut falls apart, the Mikdash falls apart, and that's it. The question is why? The question, first of all, is why is it that this is the way that it deteriorates, the shavings off of, of the people, essentially, and where we look at not a, an implosion, if you will, of the Malchut, but a slow layer by layer by layer shaving of the Malchut, deterioration of the Malchut. Why does it happen in those terms? First of all, and second of all, why is the Bayit so central? The Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, so central and connected to the nature of the Malchut of Israel. That's the book. I mean, we can end here. That's basically the whole book. Just a little bit of insight, perhaps. But that's what we're reading. And the elements, it's possible, one could make the case and say that perhaps it's the most important book of the Tanakh that anyone could read today. Because it is the book that tells us the story of our Galut. In other words, one understands Galut by reading Sefer Melachim, ironically. Because you read the story of how you got here. And if a person wants to understand Galut, which we are still in, unfortunately, we are very, very loudly in now. I mean, you know, you don't have to go a day without hearing some type of attack on the Jewish people, where the Jewish people are looked at as the bane of our existence on this planet, right? I mean, everybody looks at us as the ultimate disaster that has ever fallen upon the world. They're intolerable, no matter where it is that they live. Some places are vocal about it, some places aren't, but everybody agrees that the Jews are intolerable. The very fact that they have an address on the planet again is absolutely harrowing and, and impossible to tolerate. But how do you get here? I mean, this is a question that we have to ask ourselves. How did we get here? Why is this the case? It's very easy to look and point the fingers and say, well, they just, they're horrible people. I mean, you know, they're just saying, spewing the same old anti-Semitism again and again. But the fact of the matter is that we got here, and the way that we are told that we got here is not simply because other people hated us. 
The way that we're told that we got here is the story of our own falling. That's Sefer Melachim. So again, perhaps it is one of the most important books in the Tanakh that we could study today. Because it tells us how we got here. And in order to be able to understand it, we have to understand, first of all, what the full moon is. And that's what the book does very well. It presents to us the Malchut of Shlomo HaMelech. And what a 40-year run that was. Think about it, it's only 40 years. In a 3,000-year history, it was barely the blink of an eye. And not even the full 40 years, really. I mean, between you and me, it wasn't even the full 40 years. We like to say that it was, but it wasn't. It didn't really go well. As a matter of fact, right off the bat, it fell apart. It didn't get off the ground before already falling apart. And we'll point that out in a minute. Shlomo HaMelech didn't get out of the gate without already undermining his entire malchut. And that's what happens with the moon, isn't it? I mean, you don't really have a full moon for very long. It's, you know, a day, maybe. It already starts you know, running back. So there was a moment there where there was a beautiful malchut, where there was a flash of what it might mean to be Israel. And where the king seems to be someone who is not only a great individual, but expressive in his being of the greatness of the people that he represents. Yes? Where when he's speaking, everybody wants to hear what he has to say. Regardless of what he's talking about. He could be talking about the trees, as the Pasuk says. Could be talking about the birds. Could be talking about the moss that's growing out of the rocks. And everybody wants to come hear what he has to say. There's love. They cannot get enough of Shlomo Melech. So they come from far and wide to listen. Because when people listen to Shlomo, they feel more alive. They feel like their life means something. They feel like the world means something. And for the first time, probably the first time, and probably one of the last times in Jewish history, Yisrael looks amazingly attractive in a way that people do not feel defensive and threatened by their presence. I'm going to say that again. For the first time, perhaps, in all of our history, and perhaps the last time since then, the nation of Israel, not the religion, the nation, the people, the nation of Israel, looks attractive, beautiful, strong, helpful, wise, to the entire world. in a way that isn't threatening and that doesn't put people on the defensive. Instead, what's happening is people are coming far and wide to hear what the nation of Israel has to say. And so you have stories of the Queen of Sheba, right? Malchat, Malkat Sheba comes to see Shlomo Fantastic, Maran Bava Kama, this is parenthetical, but I think important, important to what we're going to deal with. Gamaran Bava Kama says, anybody who says that the Queen of Sheba was a woman, wrong. And that's the, one of those Gemarot where you look and it's a little hard, even if you're really faithful, you know, you say, what are you talking about? Come on. En mikra yotze mide pshuto. And the Maharsha, has a fantastic perush. No question in my mind that I think it's one of the, I mean, who am I to say, but it's just one of those amazing perushim that just hits the heart of the matter. 
And he says, of course she was a woman, she was a female. What it means is that she wasn't just a woman. She was Shiva. She was Shiva. She was a country. It's like they say about the queen. May she live long. <laughs> they say about the queen. She is the country <laughs> on legs. And it's amazing. It's one of the reasons why she's, she's, she's probably, in my opinion, and I'm not just saying this, she is one of the last great monarchs on the planet. She is a queen in every sense of the word because she understands what it means to be an individual that is no longer an individual. That her entire life essentially is expressive of the country. She is the country. And that's what the Maharsha says it means when you say the Malkat Sheva was not a woman. She wasn't just a woman that was coming to see Shulman Melech. She was a country, says the Maharsha. And that opens us to understanding what it is that a Melech or a Malka is. Take a look, if you will, on the sheets, if you have the sheets. In Sefer Devarim and Parashat Shofetim, and where what a king of Israel is, it's outlined. This is it. This is the source. And it opens up saying, When you come into this land that God is giving you, you will inherit it. You will sit in this land, live in this land. And you will say, one day. This is not a command. It's talking about a series of events over here. Ve'amarta, you say, you'll say, Asim alai melech. You know, I'd like to have a king upon me, kechol agoyim asher sevivotai, like all those other nations that are around me. I'm a nation, they're a nation, I should be no different than the other nation. Som tasim alecha melech, by all means. Place a king upon you. Asher yivhar adonai lo echabo, that God will choose. You'll see. You'll know. If God chose him, you'll know. You pull him from your brothers. One of you. Don't bring some foreign person in for this, right? This is going to be an heir apparent that comes from you, within you, your people. Oh, no strangers. Shouldn't have too many wives. Shouldn't have too much gold and silver. Now when he sits on this throne, he'll write a Sefer Torah, I'll be with him all the time. He'll have to read it all the time. All of his days. Pasukaf, last pasuk, libilti rum levavo me'ahav. And so his heart will not rise above his brother. His heart will not rise above his... What does that mean? How on earth is a king supposed to be a king if he's not supposed to rise above his brothers? The whole point is the fact that he's a nasi. Nasi ba'amechai lo ta'or is talking about a king, right? A, a nasi literally means a person that is raised above. It's literally what the word means. So what is this? No, his heart is not allowed to be lifted beyond. How do we understand that? What is that, that element of a king? So to understand that, there's a famous midrash, I'm sure you've heard it, that King David, who we understand to be the quintessential king in Israel, we talk about David, Melech Israel, Hai Kayam. we talk about the Mashiach being Ben David, the son of David HaMelech. HaGadosh Baruch Hu references David all the time when he talks about renewing the Malchut. Ke David Avdi. I'll bring somebody like my servant David. Not Shlomo, it's David. David is the quintessential king. 
He's in Sefer Shmuel, right? For all intents and purposes. And so, David becomes our paradigm of Melech. What it is that a Melech Israel is. And there's this famous Midrash about David that says he was born and Adam Arishon was given the courtesy by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to see all the Malchuyot that would come in the future. Some say he was shown all the Nefashot, all the souls that were going to be born in the future. And along comes the soul of David Amelech. And he sees that the amount, the lifespan of this soul of David Amelech is one day. Anybody hear this before or is this just me, right? You've heard this before, no? Okay. So, Adam Arishon, I mean, it's told in various ways throughout the Midrash. Adam Arishon sees this, he goes, what? One day? This is a fantastic neshama. I mean, this is one of the greatest things you've ever made. It's a great neshama. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Kadosh Baruch Hu. I've got a thousand years, Right? Got a thousand years. I'm going to take 70 of my years. I'll give them to David Amelech. How about that? Can we do that? Galosh Baruch Hu says, fine, if that's what you want to do, I can arrange that. It's not a problem. So you're 930 and he's 70? Yeah, I'm 930. He said, I'll take 930. Fine, no problem. Check, 930, 70. Done, no problem. David, Adam Arishon dies at 930 years old. David Amelech lives 70 years. Works out perfectly. What's the point of this? What does this mean that David Melech has a one day? Where does that even get off? Why? What's the point of that? What's the point of making an Ishamaf? David Melech only has a year to live, a day to live. What's the idea? Zohar says, another idea, just to be able to try and piece this together. Zohar says, so I put these two midrashim for you there. They bring it in two different ways you have them. Zohar says, Amar of Yehuda, Hashem Anam Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Yehuda says, You know, we heard from Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The high krait mar alinun yomin did gezeru aloy and Adam kadma'a. Says in the Pasuk, Yemeshen otenu, Shirim Shana. Ving buvorot, Shirim Shana. So it says, Yemeshen otenu, Shirim Shana. Our years are 70. So the Zohar says, This is talking about what? The 70 years that Adam Arishon took from his years and gave over to David Amelech, these become the years of a human life. And so it says, and it continues, says, Inun Shirim de Aitmar de Hayin Kelal. They are general life. They are the entirety of life. Klal. Uses this word klal. Klal meaning. The entirety, right? Cloud. La vule, right? Didn't really have years of his own life, David. So Adam gave him his years. Shirin Shinin. Gave him 70. Virazada. Vilon la mishamesh kilum visihara la naharad megarma kilal. Vishivirin shinin niharin la bechol sitrahav inun haye David. Meaning, it had, David Melech had none of his own. Didn't shine from anything of itself. Same way the sun, right, shines on the moon. The moon doesn't have any of its own life. David Melech had none of his own life. It's referenced back to the moon again. With regards to the Malchut and so on and so forth. Didn't have anything of its own. So the Zohar is essentially saying that Malchut, David, has nothing of his own. Doesn't come from him. Nothing comes from him. Garma, the word used over here in the Zohar, literally means what? Bone. Garma is bone. In Hebrew, we use the same word to talk about self. How do I say myself? Atzmi. Etzem literally is a bone. Right? It's funny, it's an interesting. The concrete word of self is the bone. Right? That's how we recognize self. Otherwise, it might be a sack of skin and, and meat and whatever. You know, the, the, the form of self is through the bones. The fact that a person has a skeleton. That's atzim. Atzmi. Atzim atamai. 
And so in Aramaic, it's the same words, garmeh. So when it says, garmeh, en lo me'atzmo klum. Malchut has none of its own. David had nothing of his own. And that's what it is that I'm suggesting is the bilti rum levavo me'hav, meaning, of course the king becomes a king. He's a nasi, there's no question about it. But he is not himself. He's not his own being. He is the nation. He is expressive of the entirety of the nation. He is the emergence of the interactions of every individual, of every region, of every Shevet. He becomes the expression of the people. You hear this? Following? That's the Lebelti Rum, meaning he cannot be, a king cannot be, simply a me that is on top of the nation. I will rule the nation as I see. No. A king is what it is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu chooses. There'll come a time where you will say, I'd like to place a king on our heads. These are all series of events. It's the way that it's put out in the Pesukim. How things will do. You'll come into the land. You'll sit in the land. You will coalesce as a nation. How long, by the way, does it take for the nation to coalesce? You've been through this too. How long? Over 300 years. Bayamimahem. This is the constant, well not constant, but the beginning and ending refrain of which sefer? Shofetim. You've just been through it. It's wonderful. You do it a perek a day. It's right there, fresh in the memory. You see the entire thing. So you look at this book of absolute chaos, 300 some odd years of chaos with leaders that you would never accept in normal circumstances. You've got this amazing woman that's leading the people during this time. You've got this, this Schwarzenegger type individual that's leading people, ripping gates of a city off on his back, running, who knows, Cray, got a get on guy who's, you know, this kid farmer all of a sudden ends up becoming Superman. What? Crazy people. And what it just keeps telling me at the beginning, at the end of the book, Bayami Mahem, what? En Melech Bi Israel. There's no malchut running in this place. Ish hayashar be'enav Ish, every man for himself. Except that they're not doing whatever they want, right? What does it say? Ish hayashar be'enav. Everybody's looking for what's straight. They're finding themselves, developing themselves, working in terms of coalescing themselves, self-organizing as a nation. And so they finally come to a point in where they coalesce as a nation just about, and they preempt. Instead of it being an heir apparent, instead of it being an individual that almost suggests itself that this is an individual that is expressive of the people, that clearly should be the individual that leads the people, what happens? What happens? They go shopping for a king. They decide, no, I think we need a king. We got to go out and find a king. And this is why Shmuel gets so upset. He doesn't get upset because it's his time is up. His time was up anyway. That's how it opens up. Pizukim are here. Put him on the page for you. And what Kadosh Baruch Hu says to Shmuel is, they're not upset with you. Otimasu, says the Kadosh Baruch Hu. They're sick of me, not of you. They're tired of running with life and where it is that life brings them. They're tired of developing and responding and dealing with what I throw at them in order to be able to help them coalesce as a nation. They're done with me. They just want to have some type of security system 
Because that's what it is. Why do they ask for a king? We need somebody who's going to fight our wars. Because it was relentless. The plishtim and who knows what else. Every kind of enemy. You know, it's the enemy of the weak, basically, in all of Sefer Shofiti. So they want a security system. They want a security system? Fine. Security systems are very expensive. Shmuel, tell them what it's going to cost them to have a security system. I'm much cheaper, Kadosh Baruch Hu says. But if they want a security system, they will have everything taken from them. Everything. Their sons, their daughters, their crops, their land. Everything will be taken from them. Because what they will have is not an heir apparent. What they will have is not someone that is among their brothers, that emerges from within them, that is clearly the development of the process of self-organization and self-creation. What they will have is a person that wants to rule over them. And he will take from them everything they have to rule. He will take from the very elements that give him life as a king. Because where does a king get his life? If not from the people. Where does a king get his existence? If not from the people. And that is the mistake that every single European king has ever made. It's why they were evil kings. Because they didn't see their throne as being something that came from the people over which they ruled. They saw their throne as being imposed by God over the people. And that's why the Achamim say that the kings of the Goyim, this is what it is, they're only simply observing history, that the kings of the Goyim had no mercy. They beat the people. They took from the people. Not so the kings of Israel. Except more accurately, it was not so the kings of Yehuda. So there's a halakha that comes out of this. There's a halakha that comes out of this. Because the kings of Yehuda, in their righteousness, were libilti rum levavom erhav type of king. It was a king that emerged. Who knows the story of David? Review, review. The whole book of Shmuel is a story of this gradual ascent of this little boy who was watching sheep became the king of Israel. What's his claim to fame? He took down a bear. This is his claim to fame, right? But there's one thing about this boy, and that is his clarity, his absolute clarity of the one thing that the rest of the nation rejected when they asked for a king. The presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in Israel. The Shekhinah in Israel. It was so clear to David like, like, like the sun in the sky. Where do we see this? We see it all over the place, but the first place that we see it is when he goes to fight Goliath. Goes to fight Goliath. He walks onto the field. Everybody's scared half to death because they've got this wahash dib that's coming out to go fight them, right? Takes this, you know, comes out laughing at everybody. Everybody's scared half to death and David is looking around and he only says one thing. He goes, wait, I don't understand. Wait a minute. Does he have a brit milah? I mean, he's, you know, he's got a foreskin like all the rest of them, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. I, what's the problem? He doesn't exist. Anybody have a few pebbles? Anybody have a pebble? I'll take care of this. This is how David relates to the entire issue. You worried? You're Tzvot Hashem. What are you talking about? Who are these people? They're a bunch of Arelim. You're telling me that you're worried about him because he's big and ugly? Get me a few pebbles, for God's sakes. 
This is who David is. And guess what? It's all Shaul needs to see. In order for him to know, he's the king. He can't stand it. I mean, it's clear, but it's clear to Shaul. That's the king. Takes the people a little bit of time, but a minute at that moment, it's the one line that changes everything. They see it, they say it, Shaul hears it, he knows everybody else knows it. It's clear in everybody's eyes. And the question there is only one question. Are we going to recognize it or are we not going to recognize it? Are we going to pretend that it's not there? And it makes Shaul crazy, literally. And so he becomes a king that is no longer, Shaul becomes a king that is no longer expressive of the people. He becomes completely detached from the people. He becomes an individual that is so self-protective and paranoid that he no longer can think straight. He's lost his entire way. He starts attacking David relentlessly, obsessively, except for these small interludes of sanity that come to him when he actually sees David. Hatazebni David? Is that you, David? It's me. I don't know what I did. What did I do? No, you're wonderful. I'm sorry. I don't know. I mean, it's a craziness. So you hear the difference between a king that is thrust by the force and flow of life itself to take the helm, where it's an heir apparent. Nobody disputes it. The only people that dispute it are a few remnants of Shaul's house. Everybody, Abner himself is coming to David. Whatever you want, whatever you need. Everybody, everybody recognizes David is the king. That's a melech. That's a som tasim alecha melech. Shem har Hashem alecha, which I choose. You'll know what I choose. It'll be clear when I choose. Nobody will question when I choose. And what ends up happening in Melachim is this deterioration. And where you have this king that ends up becoming very much like Shaul. Yerovah. Even though he starts okay, he ends up becoming this way. He's got to build his own Mikdash. He's got to barricade the road up to Yerushalayim so nobody goes up to it. He becomes a paranoid and obsessive in the same way and he rules the people with an iron fist. Every European king took their cue from Yerovam ben Evad, thinking that they were taking their cue from David HaMelech. So till today, the kings are anointed and they take their models from the Tanakh thinking that they're Davidic kings, when in reality, they're not Davidic kings. They're the other type of king that the Achamim talk about. That you know what? You don't call him to trial, which is the halakha. You can call the king of Israel if he's from David, if he's a king of Yehuda, you can call him to trial. The Sanhedrin, you talk about checks and balances, the king can be brought to court and tried in Israel. Unless he's a king of Israel, meaning a Yerovam ben Evatnik. Which is throughout the whole book. You'll see, oh, he was like Yerovam ben Evat. He was like Yerovam. Why? Because they will kill you if you try it. Don't you touch my seat. Don't you even try to question my malchut. And the reason for it is very simple. If your throne is one that is imposed artificially over the people rather than one that emerges naturally from within the people you are always afraid and you sleep with one eye open but if you are the man or woman perhaps never know right although halakha currently is that it wouldn't be but never know that ends up coming out from emergence, from the development of history, from 300 plus years of self-organization, where you are the heir apparent, where nobody disputes 
what it is that you are, who it is that you are, what it is that you've done, that the king that is now on the throne recognizes without a shadow of a doubt that you are the one that will succeed him, where he tells his son, Ben Na'avat Hamardut, don't you see, you blind man, who's going to take your father's throne? Don't you care? Moron! This is what Shaul tells his son, you idiot! Don't you see that he's going, take my throne? Can't you see that he's the king? Everybody with eyes in their head sees that he's the king. That is a Melech Israel. But that Melech can be called to the Sanhedrin for trial. Because that Melech doesn't question his throne. Or who he is. Or why he's there. Or how he got there. It is an emergent development from the coalescing of Am Israel. And his every ounce of strength comes from those people, from that connection, from that building of the people. So we've been at it for a little bit more than 300 years this time around. But it's coming close. And people are getting Shaul-like nervous, aren't they? Very nervous. You know, it starts with simple things when you try to annihilate them and they come out of it. It's bad enough. You know, everybody kind of looked the other way, gritting their teeth and closing their eyes, hoping that it would end ugly, but nonetheless, without them. But then they come out of this whole thing. All right, that's bad enough. But they come out of it and then they get an address which if it was Uganda would still be a horrible problem, you understand. Because you fix them an address on the planet, it just means that they get to have the time to, you know, huddle and think about things. It's like Mark Twain wrote. You know, if it were up to me, he says, I'd be against the homeland for these people. He didn't say it in an anti-Semitic way, he just said it in a matter-of-fact way. So, you know, you get a bunch of these people together and they'll end up overthrowing the, the entire world. It's like the horses. I'm paraphrasing. But this is what he says. You know, it's like the horses. If the horse knew its strength, we'd never ride again. You get the most cunning minds in the world together in you know, a patch of land that they get to be able to spend time on their own. Forget it. This is what he says. Smart, smart. I mean, he was a smart man. Then they start doing things in this place, you know, they start doing all kinds of crazy things like, uh, I don't know, irrigation that ends up growing things in the middle of death, you know. Death, I mean, every, nothing should be living in this place at all. Oh, it's got, you got, you know, olives growing and, you know, all kinds of green special stuff happening. People that shouldn't walk are walking, you know, all these kind of crazy things. You get Shaul-like nervous, you understand? Relentless pursuit to death. Because can't you see? They're the king. But as the Hachamim say, En ha'or nikar ela choshech. You don't know light unless you know darkness. Our own people don't know light without knowing darkness. You don't study Sefer Melachim, you have no idea what's going on over here. And Sefer Melachim is the inverse. What you start with is a full moon in Sefer Melachim. A glimpse of what it means to be Israel. Where the country of Sheba is coming to see the country of Israel. Spend time learning from the country of Israel, where every country is in dialogue with Israel, looking for guidance from Israel, without hesitation, without worry, prepared to be able to be connected to wherever it is that these people are going. Just let them be connected. Shlomo is marrying every country perhaps getting a bit ahead of himself. But the funny thing is, is that's not what got him ahead of himself. This is a bit subtle. 
and I see some eyes so slightly getting heavy. It's two and a half, what is it, three in the morning for me. Your eyes shouldn't be getting heavy. <laughs> this is what happens. If Shlomo HaMelech is the emergent expression of all of Am Yisrael, then he's ready to be able to take us to the next level. He's ready to touch Olam Abba with us, if you will. Because what is Olam Abba but the emergence of Olam Azeh? What is Olam Abba but the coalescence of the entire world that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created into its wholeness, fullness, beauty, perfection? Yes? You follow my train of thought? What I'm, yes? That's what Olam Abba. What is Olam Abba but the emergence of Olam Azeh into its perfection and its pristine beauty? And where all of the people who inhabit it are the people, as Harambam says, Hachamim ve'etrotehem berashehem. The Hachamim said, with their crowns on their head, every one of them a king. Like it says in Masechet Gitin, Man malke Rabbanan. Who's a king? The Hacham. Why the Hacham? Not because he learned Basar Behalab. Sorry for whoever's in Kolel. Not because of that. Because a Hacham is a person who sees the world in its entirety. Sees the world that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. And the Yehud of that world. Rashid Chochma Yirat Adonai. Just to know God is the beginning. To see the world emerge in its beautiful unity. In all of its diversity. Not to be xenophobic. Xenophobic meaning afraid of the stranger, but rather to love the stranger, to reach out, to connect, to see all that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought into this world in all of its diversity and understand it to coalesce into one beautiful, pristine image. That is the Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed that none of us can say out loud. Because we're not there yet. And that's Olam Abba. It is golden. Why golden? Because it's the one metal that you can't destroy. It's eternal. It's as close to eternity as we've got. How do you destroy it? Throw it into the sea? It'll wait there for years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, until somebody dives in and gets it. Melt it down, gets even better. How do you destroy it? How do you get rid of it? How does it rot? It's the closest thing that we have to eternity. You know what Shlomo HaMelech did with gold? He built the Beit HaMikdash. It's that one place that you enter and connect to the next level, to the emergent place. Yeah? Have you read? You'll read now. Pay attention to Perek Vav in Sefer Melachim. When it talks, you know, the boring parts, where it talks about the architecture of the Bikdash. And be riveted in what you read that every single element of that house was made in gold. Like he was obsessed with gold, which was wrong, by the way. Read the Vrei Yamim, and by the way, when you get around to it, the only way to learn Sefer Melachim is to read the Vrei Yamim with it. The whole way to read the Vrei Rishonim is to read the Vrei Yamim with it. But read the Vrei Yamim Kafhet with Perek Vav, and you'll see very clearly that his father David insisted that he use silver when he built the Mikdash. And Shlomo defies his father and refuses to use silver in the Mikdash. And the pasuk at the end of the building of the Mikdash in Melachim says explicitly that Shlomo put away all the silver that David his father had left him to make the Mikdash. Here, my friends, is the beginning of the downfall of Shlomo HaMelech, in my opinion. I suggest it's here where he falls apart. Because, and this is subtle, but I'm going to say it, 
Shlomo believed that once they had reached that level, they no longer had to pay attention to how they got there. Meaning, once they had reached the emergent place, they didn't need to maintain tethering to the lower levels that got them there. And that is the fatal mistake of a king. The minute that the king, being king, no longer recognizes the lower elements that produce his position, the minute that an olam haba mind no longer is sensitive to the olam hazeh ingredients that came together to produce it, yes, you follow? It's over. It's ivory towers. It's like what Yerovam ben Evad dealt with, if you know the Midrash, Migdal Poreach Ba'avir. These things that are floating in the middle of the air that have no connection to anything. That is the end of a king. It's the end of a king. It's the end of a government. It's the end of a tzaddik. Whatever way you want to look at it, whatever level you want to look at it, it's the end of a person who has reached the top and has forgotten that it is the bottom that got him there. Silver is expressive of the drives, the ugly drives, the drives that we fight with on a daily basis that get us through this world, that we fight with in order to be able to achieve the levels that we ultimately aim for. Why silver? That's its name, kesef. You know what kesef means in Hebrew? Desire. It's what the word means. Why are th- what else? What other word would you give for money? Nechsof nechsaf. Kesef means desire. And that's why brilliantly, you know what Bitzalel does in this week's parasha, last week's parasha? You know what he does with the silver? By the way, it's beautiful that we're reading these parashiot now. This is exactly the time. That's a siman, by the way, Jesse. This is a good project. It's going very nicely with the timeline. All converges beautifully. You know what Bitzalel did with the silver? He made hashukim with the silver, which is the same word, by the way. Heshek. What's heshek? Desire. So what does he do brilliantly? He decides to use the heshek and makes heshek out of kesef, which is exactly the same thing. What are the hashukim? These are the things that hold the amudim of the mishkan together. They hold the whole thing together. It's the thing that tethers the mishkan. The elements of desire, the early elements of drive that develop, that help us choose that prompt us to fight, that throw us in the middle of war to achieve what it is that we ultimately know that we can achieve, those are the things that you cannot forget about. It's the opening of the book of Melachim. David Melech is in a state where he has lost all the kesef. Not the money, the desire. He's in a bed with a young virgin. Forgive me, but it's the Navi. It's the opening story. Can't get warm. So they bring him a young virgin. And what does he do? He just lies with her in the bed. And you know what the Hachamim say about that? You think the Hachamim are just, what what are they thinking? But the minute you see it in context, it all comes together. You know what the Hachamim say? She thought that he needed Viagra. No, this is what? This is the Midrash. She's sitting with him in bed, and all he just needs the warmth of her being there. He doesn't do anything, he doesn't try anything. And she says to him, You know, it must be that you really have, you know, you've just lost it. It's over for you, isn't it? And he says, Excuse me. I will show you that that's not true. And he performs. This is the Midrash. I'm not, I'm not, telling, I'm not telling you anything, right? Rabbi Yeah? You know, you never know. With me, they don't trust. You're trustworthy. So they perform. He performs. Worse, it's in front of Bacheva. This whole thing is it's crazy Midrash. It's one of the craziest Midrashim in the world. This is the opening of Sefer Melachim. And then he's back to normal life that sleeps in. So what's the point over here? The point is, is that he's got it all under control. Turns it on and off at will. He's become the master. He's driving. 
He's not being driven. He's king. But there is no situation, and that's why he's pulled back, so that he doesn't move too far off into a migdal poreah ba'avir. He's pulled back. Just when I was ready to leave, they pulled me back again. Right? Into the whole thing. That's what he's saying. They pull him back into the malchut, into the day-to-day -day workings. You cannot lose yourself up into the, uh, the stratosphere and forget where it is that you came from. And Shalomot tries to do this. He says to himself, we've reached the top. We don't have to worry about those icky things anymore. Throws all the silver into the cabinet, into the safe. Doesn't use it. The kesef, the heshek, it's all not necessary. And he builds a bite of gold, of eternity. He builds an olama ba in olama zeh. That's his goal. But he's not sensitive to the fact that there is a continuum. That a melech cannot be a melech unless his heart is with his brothers. Libelti rum levavo me'ahav. And that is the first layer that is stripped away. It's the first shaving off of the moon. Shlomo begins this issue and where he thinks he can step away from it all, be in this world of gold, marry who it is that he wants, even though it says, lo yerbelo nashim, down to earth rules. Masses of gold and silver, even though it says, kesef is av lo yerbelo, down to earth rules. And that's where it begins. He makes it all of gold instead of including some silver to root it all into Heshek and Kesef. And it's all downhill from there. Literally downhill from there. To the point that you end up seeing kings that hide from the Navi just so that they don't have to hear words that remind them of a greater level of living. And then it becomes familiar. We see ourselves in the story and where we drown out in our lives the things that call us to live on higher levels, that challenge us to achieve the elements that we know we are capable of achieving, but drown out in whatever it is that we have to distract us from having to be able to achieve it. You follow what I'm saying. This I'm not going to ask you if you follow me. You know what I'm talking about. The elements in where we don't want to look at the big picture. I don't want to see the pristine emergence. I don't want to see myself as a king or queen. I'm not interested in wearing a crown. Neither were the kings of Israel in the book of Melachim. They wanted petty crowns. They wanted local crowns. And bit by bit, layer by layer, they strip away. And they lose all of the contact between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Israel. And that bayit that is meant to be the nexus between the people and those emergent levels falls apart to the point that when it is finally destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, there's a bad call that he hears. Kemach tahina tahint. You're grounding down ground flour. This, this house stopped running a long time ago. You think that if it was running and connected to where it was meant to be connected, you would have any entrance into this place? None at all. I'm going to point out one thing. The last thing on the page. The essential element of a king, the essential element of a tzaddik, who is essentially the man malke rabbanan, the knowledge that one's strength as king comes from the people, connection to where it is that one comes from and those that make one's position possible. A tzaddik, the recognition of where it is that he came from or she came from, 
what fights had to be done in order to be able to get there. Seeing somebody that is early on in the fight and not looking at that individual as a person that isn't worth one's time or one's effort or one's connection, but recognizing them as the source of what one was originally. Even a guy. Because we were all once goyim. Which is why when we tell our story as a people, we begin, Terah, Avi Avraham, Avi Nahor. But it's because of the connection that Israel has with the world that it makes a difference. That one can look at a goy and not say, I don't know. And recognize, that's what I was. That the Mishnah says, on Sukkot, that a per- the Hachamim would look, they would bring Korbanot, they would say, you know what? Avotenu, they used to bow the wrong way. This is what they would say in the Beit HaMikdash itself. You know, they used to bow that way. Now we bow this way. So we've changed. It's been a whole 180 degree turn, but we, used to, we weren't always like this. We used to pray to other things. We started in very different places. And look where we've come. Look where we've come from. When we lose that, we lose everything. And it is only a matter of time till we completely fall apart. It's all downhill from there. So there's this story, very innocent story in the Gemara, about Abban Gamliel. He was a king. He was Nasi Israel. Nasi. And it says in Masechet Horayot, Rabbi Uda Nasi says, they're having a discussion about laws of kings and how the laws of kings apply in one situation, another situation. And Rabbi Uda Nasi says, Kegon Anamai. He goes, What about me? I'm a Nasi. Do I have any of these elements? And so on. This custom, yeah, he's essentially a king. He was a Nasi of Israel. So Rabbi Gamliel was a Nasi. He was, for all intents and purposes, a king. But he was deposed, he was dethroned. Because he had lost contact with his people. And the story goes that he comes into the Beit Midrash after he was dethroned and saw that the level of learning was so powerful that there was not a halacha that they had not addressed and detailed and come to a conclusion with. And he felt terrible that because of his high and elite vision of what it was that this needed to be, a Ben Midrash needed to be, Israel needed to be, he lost all of the capacity of the engines, the gears, that make everything move in the catacombs underneath. So he insulted Rabbi Yoshua. No, it's a very long story. How? If you know it, wonderful. If not, just accept that he insulted Rabbi Yoshua. So he goes to visit Rabbi Yoshua. Finally, after this whole ordeal, he's been deposed, he comes back, sees what happened, he goes, you know what? Let's go appease Rabbi Yoshua. So he walks into Rabbi Yoshua's house and he saw what was going on in the Beit Midrash. He says, Izir Rabbi Yoshua. I want to go and appease. That's what Afayes means. I'm going to appease Rabbi Yoshua. Walks into his house and he doesn't get off to a good start. Unfortunately, it's a classic Rabban Gamliel move. What he says is, Kimatale Bete walks into his house, Hazin Hula Shita de Bete dem Shaharan. He saw that the, the, the walls of his house are all black. Everything's black, black, everything's black. Amarlo says to him, Mikotle Betecha Tanikar She Pehamiata. He goes, You know what? Seems from the walls of your house that you must be a blacksmith, you know, you you coal miner, coal worker. Rabbi Yoshua hears this and he says to him, Amarlo, Oi lo la dor parnaso. Woe to the generation that you are the manager of, or that you are leading. No, it didn't I mean it wasn't a nice opening, unfortunately. Rabban Gamaliel, you know. Kind of need to take his foot out of his mouth. Why does he say that? It says to him, You don't know how the Talmidei Achamim are suffering to try and make ends meet? I'm in your bed midrash every day. You see me every day. 
Never thought to ask, what does he do for a living? Towers flying in the air. Ivory towers. You didn't think one minute, maybe, what does a Biyushua do? I was easy for you to insult me. But you never asked what I did for a living. You have no idea how I spend my days, do you? How many days do I sit with you in the Bet Midrash? Do I discuss with you? No, it's only theoretics. Sure, we speak Torah. Do I have any per type of relationship? Do you, am, I, am I a human being? Am I a person? Do I have a life that you care about, that you're saying? You're the king, for goodness sakes. You don't know who I am? It's Lehabdil Elif Abdalot, Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake. Sure. Your Majesty, the people have no bread. Well, let them eat cake. Idiot. Really? No, that, it's, the, it's the end of any capacity for malchut, which means it's the end of any capacity to emerge and achieve levels of purity, of perfection, of wholeness. That's what a king is for. It's what a president is for. It's what royalty is. And Israel is royalty. We either recognize it or we don't. You can't make somebody a king. That's the whole point of Shaul HaMelech. You can't make someone a king. You either achieve it or you don't. It either suggests itself or it doesn't happen. We'll end with this. Sefer Melachim is one of the most important books that you can learn at this time, in my humble opinion. You will see layer by layer the reduction of Yisrael. What it was to be under the rule of Shalomo and what it means ultimately to reduce the people down to nothing more than flesh and blood, conscious animals roaming on top of the earth that end up enslaved, enslaved by foreign people. Step by step you will read, chapter after chapter, you will see the downward slide. And what you're living in today is a gradual ascent. And this is what I want to leave you with. And this is just my, my perspective, so really you can toss it on your way out. What you're watching is a gradual ascent. 70 years. From the ashes, 70 years are coming up. I'm not saying anything's going to happen at the end of 70. I'm just saying that's generally a lifetime. 70 years from Auschwitz is a lifetime. It's one human lifetime. And what you're watching along with the rest of the world, is the nation of Israel going through the ends of what you read about in Sefer Shofetim. It's chaos. And I know that I am not the only one that watches this world on a daily basis and feel that we are living in chaos. Chaos. En melech Israel. And yet, there's this gradual ascension of the people, of the Jewish people, on every level, connecting to who we are, what we think we are, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, over the last 70 years, trying this, trying that, working on this, working on that, coming into contact. Just think about, think about this, that at the end of World War II, Jewish people that had not known of each other or had refused to associate with each other, who found themselves thrown into a pot together, having to see each other, speak to each other, engage with each other in ways that they never had before. Here, in this country, in Eretz Israel, around the world. You think Ashkenazim knew what a Sfaradi was? They still don't very much know what it's about, but still, I mean, now they, they know about us, we, we, we exist here, or whatever. 
But it's not just that. You're talking about Ashkenazim, Sephardim. You're talking about Jews who lived in different countries in Europe didn't associate with each other. Sephardim who lived in different countries in the Middle East barely associated with each other. Everybody throws them into the same basket. Forget about the Western Sephardim. Still, nobody has any idea what that is. Nobody knows where, what's with them. And all of a sudden, everybody's thrown into the same bowl, forced to deal with each other, to question what it means not to be an ethnic religious group, but what it means to be a nation, and what that nation has the capacity to do. And the world is watching this, and they are scared. Because whether it's conscious or subconscious, it's clear that it is gaining momentum. And it has gained momentum before, and you've got to be crazy to think that it's not something you've got to worry about. And what's happening to us? We're gaining momentum, and we're scared. It's the same level of scared that a person gets when they come close to achievement. And the fear of achievement sabotages the achievement. You know what I'm talking about? When you come this close to winning, and the thought of winning psychs you out. And you step away from it in fear. You know what I'm talking about. That's where we're at. And that is the story of Sefer Merachim. So I wish you well on the journey through it. It is an amazing journey. Look at it. Learn it internalize it, and understand that it is not history that you are reading in that book. You're reading the story of your life in that book. And all we are is the current manifestation of that aftermath. And the question is only, when do you wish to go back home? And does it need to be on your terms? Or is it a sheriff hara dunaydoecha? If it's on your terms, look at the story. If it's a sheriff hara dunaydoecha, like David, there's no question. It doesn't exist. All you need are a few pebbles, and you'll take care of the entire thing. Iratzon that we should be able to be zochet to see it, and its fruition. Amen.